morning, everybody. You survived work camp. Congratulations. Yeah. It's been a great weekend, hasn't it? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. This is about as good as I can do, but hopefully I can project well enough to get you guys in the back. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nathan Ingram. I'm the host at iThemes Training. We do two or three live webinars a week on all sorts of WordPress topics from business development to code to blogging to SEO, all of those things. Kind of like being at WordCamp all year long. Uh, most of those webinars are free, by the way. It's pretty awesome. Uh, I also have a small agency in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from. I work with uh, clients, small business, nonprofit, professional firm, uh, and I also do uh, coaching with WordPress freelancers. So what we're talking about today is the challenge of change, how to thrive in the new world of WordPress. Now, you know, they say that your first slide really ought to get people's attention. <laughs> I hate WordPress. Hate it. It's going to ruin my business. These are words that I said to a friend back in 2008. <laughs> uh, I was actually talking to that same friend uh, as I was preparing this talk, and we recalled that conversation. I started in web development in 1995. So when it comes to the web, I'm a geezer. Anybody been around that long? 95-ish? Yeah. So I really, the web was just taking off. Uh, I started out using a piece of software, and for you old timers in the room, it was called Hot Dog. <laughs> you remember Hot Dog? Yep. Yeah. Hot Dog. <laughs> wow. OK, this is great. So uh, Hot Dog was a glorified text editor. Uh, that was created by a company in Australia called Sausage Software. Uh, it was awesome. It was the only. It was the best thing around. Uh, and then, hey, then we got Netscape Composer, which was the a visual. You, you remember this, right? You paid for Netscape in those days. You paid fifty bucks for a browser. Uh, you know, then I, I spent a very short time in. Microsoft front page. Uh, okay. I don't like to talk about that. It's a painful memory. Uh, then, then moved into the macromedia world, and later Adobe with Dreamweaver and some uh, fireworks and those sorts of things. So I've, I've done it all. Kind of took the whole, uh, the whole trip on evolution of software. And over the years, I was able to build, gratefully, a, a, a pretty good business. I had a few excellent clients. You know, my business was really based on fewer clients. Large monthly retainers, five hundred to a thousand dollars per client, typically. Because back in those days, you know, if you wanted to change your website, what did you have to do? Oh. Call the web guy. Yeah. We want to change our picture. We want to change one sentence on the about us page. We need to change the business hours or the phone number. So you have to call the web guy, and the web guy has to update the website. Now that work was awful. It was drudgery. I hated it. But it was good money, right? Then the CMS revolution happened. Content management systems. And all of a sudden, my client started to want to edit their own website. How many of you were around back in those days? All right, so this caused a real problem for me. My response was suspicion and fear. WordPress is going to ruin my business. I'm not going to be able to charge these high dollar retainers to clients anymore. But then I realized, you know what, I have to change. I have to change or the web is going to leave me behind. So it was around 2009 or so that I found iThemes Training, which was then called webdesign.com. And I learned WordPress <coughs> over a matter of the next few months from webdesign.com. It was late 2009 when I had the worst day of my business life. One of my largest clients was, ironically, a hair salon uh, in <laughs> Birmingham. <laughs> uh, and this client, I was doing some IT work for. I was their web guy. I did some photography. And back in those days, I'd do anything to bring in money. Some of you guys have lived through that part of the world, okay, right? So I walk in. And how many of you remember what was happening in the business landscape in 2009? Those were bad years. I walked in to that client expecting just to fix a couple of problems and leave. And I left without the job anymore. In that one 10 minute conversation with the owner, who was sad about it, but had to let me go, I lost a third of my income and the health insurance for my family. That was a bad day. 
I walked out of there, and I, I remember I parked at the far end of the parking lot. It was a large parking lot. I had a long walk back to my car. And I remember saying to myself these words, I will never let this happen again. Never let this happen again. So I was already kind of in motion for change, <coughs> but I was afraid of it. This little push made me change. It was time for innovation. Over the next year, I changed to a new business model that was based on WordPress and website management contracts. Now, WordPress is awesome, but it needs somebody to watch over it to keep it running well. We all know that. Uh, so what I, I realized was that if I took on more clients at a lesser dollar, I ultimately became more profitable because now clients could manage their own websites and I get less support requests doing things that I hated to do anyway. And I'm starting to make as much money as I was before because more clients, same amount of money, less work. I mean, what's not to like about this, right? And also, I'm no longer beholden to one single client anymore. I don't change well. I was forced to change. And sometimes that's the best change at all. Because my business started to grow faster than it ever had before. And this is sort of the big idea of the talk today. Change often begins with suspicion and fear, but it results many times in innovation and growth. Now, I've been all WordPress since 2010. And I've seen a lot of changes in the WordPress landscape since that time, but we are entering into a period of transition in the WordPress ecosystem unlike we've ever experienced before because Gutenberg is coming. How many of you know what Gutenberg is? How many of you knew what Gutenberg is before this conference? Okay. Gutenberg is a completely new approach to creating content in WordPress. And the question is, why? Why do they have to change WordPress? Isn't it good enough the way it is? We love WordPress. Why do they have to change? Now, I have a confession to make. I'm something of a history nerd. Does anybody else share that proclivity? Woo! Okay. All right. So what I want to do, if, if you will indulge me, is to give you a brief history of WordPress. Because it's important to understand where we've been so that we know where we're going. How many of you have been using WordPress at least two years? Raise your hands. Keep them up for four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen? Give me eleven. Fourteen? When did you start using WordPress? 2004. 2004. You were in on the ground floor, my friend. He should get a he should get a t-shirt of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> also those that have, that camp like this. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go back 14 years to the beginning of WordPress, which started with this blog post. A blog post on Matt Mullenweg's blog on January 24th, 2003. This kid from Houston named Matt Mullenweg had a blog where he liked to share photos. He was using an open source software back then that was called. B2 Cafe Log, and he was frustrated about the lack of functionality. Now, if you look at this line right here, it says, my logging software hasn't been updated for months. Logging is web log, which became blog. And the main developer has disappeared. I can only hope that he's OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can actually go there. If you, if you Google this, you know, it's all there. All the old comments, the whole thing, it's all there. So this was January 24, 2003. So Matt starts thinking <coughs> to himself. What should I do? Uh, and th this article, by the way, wraps up with this incredible statement. Well, it would be nice to have the flexibility of movable type, which is a big CMS back then, the parsing of text pattern, the hackability of B2, and the ease of setup of Blogger. Someday, right? A comment popped in the next day from a <coughs> developer named Mike Little. If you're serious about forking B2, I'd be interested in contributing. I'm sure there are one or two others in the community who would be too. This reply is the beginning of what is now 30% of the internet. Isn't that amazing? So if you're a history nerd, go back in, Google that article, and just follow the trail. It's pretty, pretty interesting. It's still out there on Matt's blog, ma.tt. About 
a year later, WordPress 1.0 was released, January 2004. Beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's WordPress 1.0. It had a new SEO-friendly URL structure, multiple categories, you could post pictures, you could post text, very easy to use. A few months later, 1.2 added this new thing called plugins, back in 2004. WordPress 1.5, about a year later, added pages and posts to WordPress. Phenomenal, and something that still confuses users to this day. <laughs> What's a page? What's a post? I don't know. What's a page? I don't know. Right. All right. 2005, WordPress 2.0, complete overhaul to the interface, lots faster. It's running on Ajax now to perform certain tasks. WordPress is starting to grow up. To WordPress 2.3 in 2007, WordPress is chugging along, not many. Huge improvements, but 2.3 ads, tags, which also confuse users to this day. Why categories? Why tags? There's a reason, but you know. Okay. WordPress 2.5, major upgrade. The WordPress team collaborated with a design firm to totally overhaul the user interface. They added a beautiful dashboard. It's really the foundation of how we use WordPress today. Um, also, this introduced the one-click upgrade for plugins, which is just huge, right? The other big thing that 2.5 brought in was this. How many of you could use this today? You know exactly what it is. It's the Tiny MC editor that we use today in our, our blog and WordPress as it stands today. 4.9.5-ish of where we are now. That came back in 2008. Ten years ago was when Tiny MCE was introduced into WordPress, this visual editor. Now let's skip forward five and a half years. It's now 2013. A lot has changed with WordPress under the hood. But the editor interface is virtually the same. It's still tiny MCE. Now 3.8 brought in a, this mobile friendly stuff so you could now do your blog on your phone. It's fantastic. This is essentially the same design that we see today in WordPress. That was 2013. That's a geological epoch in web years. <laughs> WordPress 4.9 dropped in November 2017. Four more years forward, the interface has cleaned up a little bit, but it's virtually the same. But for 14 years, since WordPress 1.0, there's one major thing that has never changed. You know what it is? You type your stuff in the box. <laughs> right? WordPress 4.9, you type your stuff in the box. Still the same thing we use today. It's not very hard to use, but oftentimes what you type in the box doesn't really look like what you get on the front end of the website, right? The fonts aren't right, the sizes aren't right, you can't make columns without using an add-in of some sort. We got this quirky thing called a short code that frustrates new users to this day. It's a necessary evil, but it's clunky. It is what it is. WordPress 5.0 is coming at some point this year. And this is what it's going to look like. It's a big box, but it's a lot different than what we're used to today. This is Gutenberg. It's a completely new approach to adding content in WordPress. Everything is a block. Paragraphs are blocks. Headings are blocks. Images are blocks. Lists are blocks. Galleries are blocks. Photos are blocks. Embedded media is a block. Now, how many of you have tried Gutenberg so far? Okay. How about that? Interesting. It's demo time. Somebody made a really great flat icon of Gutenberg. Isn't that wild? <laughs> okay, so we're going to do something that I hate to do, which is flip out of PowerPoint and into a browser so the world may come crashing down. But just, this is, you know, it's live, so we're going to do our best. So we're going to mirror our screens, and hopefully everything is going to work. Okay, Ow, that's amazing. All right, now this is a really great website called testgutenberg.com. Uh, this is something automatic put together. This is the back end of Gutenberg on the front end of a website. 
you can play with this and you're not going to break anything. Okay? Now, by the way, you can also today on your WordPress site download and activate Gutenberg as a plugin. Just don't do it on your live site because bad things might happen. Probably not, but it could. It's still under development. <coughs> so here's Gutenberg. And let's go to the top here. Now notice as I'm hovering over things, see things are highlighted. There's a block. Here's another block. Here's a block of text with an image. Here's a pull quote. It's a block. Each of these things operates independently. It's a nice, clean interface. If anybody has used um, Medium or Squarespace or some of the other editing platforms out there, they're a lot easier to use than WordPress. They just are. This is a step in the direction of making WordPress easier to use for the average person. Now, <laughs> click on the title. You see the permalink up here, which you can edit. You can change all these things around. Here's a cover image where you can drop in an image and type on it in WordPress. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> um, when you click on a block, some context-sensitive stuff appears over here in the margin. So you can change this to fixed or move it around. You can change the dimness of the background. Everybody is in odds. You can move your text around. You can do all the stuff right from within the WordPress editor. <coughs> Wouldn't it be nice just to change the size of text in one paragraph without having to think around in CSS? We click on a paragraph. Look, we have the ability to change the size of just that paragraph. You have the ability to turn on and off a drop cap with a toggle. You can change the color of this text with a click. You can change the background color. All this is in Gutenberg today. You can download it as a plugin. At some point later this year, they will take the code in that plugin and merge it into WordPress Core. Images work like blocks. Now here, this is a paragraph block with an image over here. We can make the image go left or right, like today, or we can pull it out of the paragraph and now it's full width. Block quotes work the same way. Let's say we want to move this block quote down. You just click the arrow and now it's moved down one. The blocks simply stack on top of each other. Now, there's a lot more here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I want to encourage you to install Gutenberg or use testgutenberg.com, play around with it. There's a lot to learn here. The first time, I'll be deadly honest, the first time I played with Gutenberg was October of last year. It was awful. It was real bad. It has gotten so much better since then. The UI has improved dramatically. There's a lot of fussing about Gutenberg, but they're developing this, this revolutionary editor in the public. So you're seeing the sausage made. Uh, and sometimes good things happen, sometimes bad things happen. How many of you develop sites for clients? How many of you would like your client watching you as you built their site? <laughs> That's what the Gutenberg team is doing, right? So this is really great. And now on the back end, again, you can install Gutenberg as a plugin. And when you do, it's active. I'm going to add a new post, and we're in Gutenberg, just like this. There's documentation here. And there's a fantastic little feedback form that takes you to uh, a, a response system. So the WordPress team that's developing Gutenberg wants your feedback. But please give constructive criticism. It sucks is not constructive criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that. Right? They want you to be part of the process. So respect that. We've got a great community. They want our input. Right? So let's give it to you. The gallery, by the way, is fantastic. Look at this. It does this automatically. It figures out how many images are there and, you know, how, you know, is it going to be two columns or three columns or whatever? And it just works all the stuff out. There's there so many fantastic features. Um, I'm going to jump out of this now for the sake of time. But I encourage you to play with Gutenberg yourself because uh, there's a lot to like about what's going on there. Okay. How many of you are excited about what you just saw? How many of you are terrified about what you just saw? 
The response of the WordPress community to Gutenberg has been about like this. <laughs> what about my site? What about page builders? How many of you are using page builders? How many of you are wondering now what the heck's going to happen to my page builder with Gutenberg? What about this certain plugin or that certain theme? Suspicion and fear. Why are they doing this? What's going to happen to WordPress? Did they have to change everything? I hate WordPress. <laughs> it's going to ruin my business. <laughs> change always begins with suspicion and fear. People typically don't like change. Gutenberg has certainly brought it to the WordPress community. But it's not the first time that a Gutenberg change has brought suspicion and fear to the world. And so if you'll indulge this history nerd a little bit longer, I think the perspective <laughs> will be worth your time. Meet little Johnny Gutenberg. <laughs> Born sometime around 1400 in, in Germany. Now, Gutenberg came from a... A uh, middle class home. The middle class was just emerging out of the Middle Ages at this time. His father was a goldsmith. Now it would really, it would have been hard to get your mind around the fact that this little kid, growing up in a very typical home in a very typical town in Germany, would make the impact that he did. But if you Google Gutenberg, you'll read something like this: Johannes Gutenberg's printing press is perhaps the most important invention of the last thousand years. Likely without the printing press, there would have been no renaissance, no industrial revolution, no technological revolution, no modern Western democracy. In other words, no modern world. Now what you may not know is that Gutenberg didn't invent the printing press. The Chinese did, a thousand years before. Gutenberg didn't even invent movable type. The Chinese beat him to that a few hundred years before he was born. Now, here's the problem. Chinese has over 10,000 characters. Can you imagine making 10,000 little blocks? English, on the other hand, in many of the European languages with 20-something characters, <coughs> fit the idea of movable type and made it a lot easier. So 15th century Europe that Gutenberg was born into was emerging from medieval times. There was this growing literacy in the middle class. They were frustrated because books were incredibly expensive. They had very limited access to written materials. And up until then, books had to be copied by hand by scribes, many of whom were monks who considered the copying of literature not only a trade to be mastered, but a sacred responsibility. Now, Gutenberg was born the son of a goldsmith. He grew up mastering the trades of engraving and smithing, and he became something of a successful businessman. So, with the growing demand for books, little Johnny Gutenberg realized that there's money to be made here. <laughs> so he sets out to solve this problem and experimented with a bunch of different printing methods. Now, Gutenberg started with the proven methods that the Chinese had come up with. He used an oil-based ink that had been perfected in China, but then he incorporated a screw press that was, had been created by farmers in Europe for pressing grapes and olives. Now, what came out of that was a press that would actually work. But the biggest innovation that Gutenberg brought were these letter blocks. Letter blocks that were precisely engraved and cast, and they could be fit together with these little grooves. You could stack a bunch of letters together and slide a pin in, and they would stay. Now, letters were placed in a type case like this. Here's a bit of trivia. The capital letters were placed in the upper case, and the smaller letters were placed in the lower case. Exactly right. So it took a while to assemble a page, letter by letter. But once it was done, you could take that block of text and print many pages with it. And once you were finished, you could pull the pen out and empty your letters back and you haven't wasted anything. It was brilliant. 
A page of type can be emptied and reset for the next page without really any waste whatsoever. So word spread quickly from Germany across the continent about Gutenberg's remarkable machine. Now, unfortunately, Gutenberg's story does not end well. Gutenberg dies penniless, having lost all of his savings in a legal battle with his partner. There's a whole other talk there. <laughs> but his printing system became a commercial success. It changed the world. Now, historians say the printing press, again, one of the key factors in the explosion of the Renaissance. At least half a million books had entered circulation by 1500, from classical Greek texts to Columbus's account of discovering the New <coughs> World. And all this access to all this literature and standard works of science really sparked creativity across the Western world. Now, 500 years later, we look back on Gutenberg's press as an amazing, amazing advancement. But not everybody in Gutenberg's time was as impressed. As a matter of fact, the response was mixed. In 1501, Pope Alexander VI threatened to excommunicate anyone who printed anything without clearing it with the authorities. And he was right to feel threatened because during that time, books published by Martin Luther and John Calvin in the 1530s sparked the Protestant Reformation. In 1540, Copernicus published his theory that the earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa, which challenged everything. It's definitely not the view of the established powers. Now, there was also another outrage in the religious community and to some degree the community at large because the acceptance of the Gutenberg Bible meant the replacement of an entire cottage industry of monk scribes who had, you know, it, this whole industry had grown up supporting their work. The efficiency of the printing press meant that roomfuls of monks were put out of work in what maybe was the first technological layoffs. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also this story about a group of French monks going on strike and taking to the streets of Paris because of the Gutenberg Press. It's amazing. Even the general public, to some degree, was skeptical of the new technology. Apparently, the uniformity of the columns and copy of the Gutenberg Bible was so mind-blowing to people that they concluded that there had to be some kind of magic involved. <laughs> uh, it's recorded that the printer's apprentice of the day was called the printer's devil. <laughs> and this actually became <laughs> the prevalent thought in France during that time, and Gutenberg's business partner, the one that sued him and took all his money, he, his partner is actually the one that published the Bible, and he was actually tried for witchcraft in Paris. Crazy. Change often begins with suspicion and fear. Though, even though the Gutenberg press was greeted with deep skepticism by many, looking back we know the impact that it had. And even just a hundred years later, the British philosopher Francis Bacon wrote that printing, gunpowder and the compass, were three inventions that changed the appearance and state of the whole world. Our own Mark Twain said, what the world is today, good and bad, it owes to Gutenberg. Everything can be traced to that source. So not only did the press foster the spread of new ideas. But new skill sets and new markets were developed. There became this growing need for writing and content creation, for typography, typesetting, editing. Whole new distribution channels were created for printed material. A whole new industry based on the trade of information was begun. Because change often begins with suspicion and fear but it usually results in innovation and growth. Now, what does this mean to WordPress? What's going to happen with WordPress Gutenberg? I have no idea. Only time will tell. But my suspicion is that Gutenberg might just spark a Cambrian explosion of innovation in the WordPress space. It's going to be much easier for the average person to create rich content in WordPress. Gutenberg is going to bring a whole new set of tools to WordPress developers. We're finally going to get much closer to that WYSIWYG editing experience where what you see really is what you get, not in Georgia font. <laughs> no more need for short codes. Easier access to advanced features. 
a renaissance for WordPress? I mean, we're already at 30% market share. How much bigger could it get? 100%. <laughs> what we may see is an explosion of new websites and new content as a result of the WordPress mission to democratize publishing. I'm excited because we get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it as a WordPress user. So let's spend the last couple of minutes here on what do you do? The change is coming. What do you do to thrive in this new world of WordPress? The first thing I would say is get to know Gutenberg. Again, testgutenberg.com, play around with it, put it on your test site. If you don't know how to set up a test site, ask your host. They can help you. Gutenberg isn't bad. It's different. It's different. And it's not finished yet. So again, add your two cents with helpful critique. It will be coming at some point later this year. We don't know when. At some point later this year. Now, if you are a website owner or you're a do-it-yourselfer, here's my advice to you. Make sure you're going to be compatible with Gutenberg. The way you do that is look at the theme that you're using. Talk to your theme provider. Look at their website. Read their blog. Reach out to support. And just ask them if they're going to be ready for Gutenberg. Now, you can expect a lot of Gutenberg compatible themes to be rolling out very soon. If you have a developer, talk to them about it. If they don't know what Gutenberg is, find another developer. <laughs> and if you don't have a developer, look around you here. That's what this event is about. If you are a WordPress freelancer or WordPress business owner, look at your theme and plugin stack. Make sure you're going to be compatible. If you're using older, if you have older sites that are using older themes and plugins, you want to have a look at those. Make sure you're following the theme and develop the theme and plugin developers on social media, their blog if they have one. Just look at everything you're using and see what those developers are doing to prepare for Gutenberg. Especially any plugin that uses a short code or puts a meta box in your page or post. You want to look at that because all that's going to change. Make sure those theme and plugin developers have a plan for that. Now, my current plan, about half my time is still spent doing client work. My current plan is to use a plugin called Classic Editor. For my two cents, the biggest issue for me as a person supporting clients is not technology, it's training. Because that's going to scare the daylights out of some of my clients that are editing their own, work, their own WordPress sites. So what Classic Editor does, once Gutenberg rolls out, you activate Classic Editor, it, you can hide the entire Gutenberg everything uh, with a single setting. Again, it's called Classic Editor. Gutenberg is still there, it's just not on. <coughs> it will be on by default, most likely, when WordPress 5.0 comes out. So I'm going to do that for a few months. We're going to let the dust settle. And then slowly, client by client, we'll start onboarding people into Gutenberg. That's my approach. You take your own. The last thing I'll say is, look, connect to the WordPress community. Events like this are awesome. They go on all the time. Atlanta is next week. Uh, Word camps happen all the time. You want to know people in the community so that if you're freaked out about Gutenberg or if you're wondering how to handle X, Y, or Z, you have other people to talk to. Why is it that WordPress has grown so dramatically? Why is it that it's bigger than Joomla, bigger than Drupal, bigger than everything else? Why is that? because of things like this happening all across the world every weekend. Because we have a fabulous community, <coughs> fabulous community of people who support not only the software, but each other. How many of you made a friend talk to somebody new this weekend? That's what it's about, right? So join a meetup, go to other word camps, talk to other people about what they're doing and what they're experiencing. Join me on iThings Training, two to three live webinars a week. We'd love to have you. They're free. Several upcoming on Gutenberg, by the way. So we'll wrap up. Change often begins with suspicion and fear. Don't stay there. Because change usually results in innovation and growth. And I, for one, am really excited about what this year holds for the innovation and growth of WordPress. My name is Nathan Ingram. You can find me at training.ithings.com or on Twitter at Nathan Ingram.